Good evening, Grace Fellowship. We welcome you here. Those are here. I can see your faces. Those of us online, thank you for joining us today. Let's just welcome and enter the presence of the Lord tonight.
Hallelujah. Glad to see everybody out tonight. We are here on a wonderful um, Thursday evening. Welcome to our Thursday evening Bible study. Hallelujah. And also, uh, those of you who are viewing tonight, we want to thank you for viewing, for tuning in. It's always an honor and a privilege to have viewers viewing online and, and uh, just watching as we are able to be a blessing to them. Do you know, church, that we are a blessing to the online viewers? Yes. We're a blessing to them. You know, um, we're live streaming and people can see us and they hear us worshiping God. You know, Victoria did an awesome job tonight. You know, let's thank God for Victoria. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, you know, some people say that, you know, they can't uh, do anything for God. You know, we have young people rising up desiring to do something for God. So you might want to just kick yourself and say, it's time to do something for God. Amen. And those of you who are viewing, I'm going to stir you tonight as well, because you and your families, I mean, you support this ministry. And that's an honor and a privilege. And we thank you because had it not been for you supporting this ministry and our wonderful covenant members here supporting this ministry, um, we don't know where we would be today. So thank you, church, and also thank you, those of you who are viewing. Tonight, we're going to look at a couple things in our Bible study. You know, I always lay the groundwork and, um, before we get to where we need to go. So put your seatbelt on. <laughs> we're going to be on a ride tonight, and I'm hoping you're going to enjoy it because we're going to start off in Luke chapter um, 15, and we're going to start off with verse 11, but we're not even going to get there yet. I really would like to talk about, you know, you and I as Christians being stable in Christianity. Turn to your neighbor and say, being stable in Christ. Be stable in Christ. Be stable in Christ. You shouted that out loud. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so there are a lot of Christians that are out there today. How many of us have ran into unstable, insecure Christians? Amen. Amen. We've, we've run into them. Because to me, Christianity, you know, is a little bit more than just identifying with Christ. Christianity is more than just saying, I believe. Christianity is more than just coming to church. You know, all of those things are wonderful and phenomenal, you know, to identify in Christ and to come to church and to say, I believe. But even in doing those things, there are still people who are unstable in Christianity and insecure in their walk with God. And you know, James, he brings that out. He says in the word of God that the double minded man is always unstable in all of his ways. It says, let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. So somebody who is a double-minded person or an unstable person in Christianity is somebody who is always wavering. They're always doubting. They're always in, they have these divided interests. There's an uncertainty within them as believers. And we know the Old Testament illustration when Elijah you know, and the children of Israel were vacillating between the love of God and the love of Baal. And Elijah said, and he declared it out loud, how long are you going to be between two opinions? He says, Christians, we're either going to serve God or we're going to serve Baal. 
And when you think about the New Testament, I'm only giving a few illustrations right now. God says we can't serve both God and mammon, or another word for mammon is money. There's a divided interest. And also in uh, Corinthians, I believe it is, it says I can't sit down and partake food from the devil's table and also the, uh, the Lord's table. Amen. And in Revelations, it says to you and I that there are the lukewarm Christians that are un that are double minded. So a double minded person always has two interests, you know, and they can't serve those two interests with 100 percent. So I can't serve God with 100 percent and I can't serve something else. There's always going to be a divide. And so I want you to know tonight that those are some of the things that causes some Christians to be unstable. But one of the things we're going to point out tonight that most Christians, you know, must understand, even those of you are, who are at home tonight, we must understand that true repentance delivers true faith in the heart of a believer. It must begin with true repentance. So now the word repent means to change one's mind, to repent. You might want to write this down, those of you who are at home, because this is going to help you out. Because when you understand about true repentance, it's going to bring you into an area of true faith. So true repentance, if you look at the Greek word, M-E-T-A, O-E-I-N, I tried pronouncing that word several times, but it means to change one's mind. Repentance is not, a, is not an emotion. Repentance is not a feeling. But it's when you and I change our mind concerning a certain behavior. I was talking to somebody earlier today when I was in the store, and they ran up to me and they said, hey, pastor, hey, pastor, do you believe that we are in the end times? And I said to the individual, I said, no, I don't believe that we are in the end times. If you do a little bit of study on, you know, Israel and how many of us believe that, you know, not everybody has heard the gospel message preached to them. The gospel message must be preached. And I said, one of the things that Jesus talks about concerning the end times for believers is to be occupied. Amen. He makes reference to be occupied, to be busy, to be active, to be available for God's use and unavailable for Satan's use. So he reminds us to be occupied during these times. To be available for God's use and unavailable for Satan's use. During this time, it's important that we are available to be used by God. To be occupied concerning the things of God. To be involved in what God has asked the church to do. We must be occupied with the kingdom of God. Because when you're occupied with God, you're no longer occupied with the devil. And so when you and I look at repentance, there are many believers in society today and God bless them. I pray for them. I pray for pastors in this area. I pray for pastors that we know. I pray for pastors throughout Connecticut and throughout New England and the United States of America. There are several things I pray for all the pastors, the true Christian pastors. I say, God, I pray, God, strengthen them in their marriages. Then I say, strengthen them in their churches. God, add people to what they are doing for your glory. Because if Satan is going to creep in somewhere, he's going to creep in into the marriage. And so if he can get the marriage and bring a divide, then there can be a divide in the church. So we must be occupied concerning the things of God. And I believe that when Christian believers understand about that word repentance, they can really begin to enter into and exercise their faith in God. When you and I understand that repentance is more than just coming to church, it's more than just feeling sorry for ourselves, it's more than just crying at the altar or being filled with 
anguish or pain. It's, it's more than just religious ordinances or doing a type of penance where I allow good deeds to outshine my bad deeds. Repentance goes beyond that. In order to become stable and secure in Christ, true repentance must be established in the life of a believer. I must make a firm inward decision. I must come to my senses. I must make a firm inward decision to change my mind concerning a certain behavior. In the Old Testament, repentance, you know, when it came to the children of Israel, was more of an outward act that took place. God said, you need to turn around. God says, you need to come up out of Egypt, and I need to bring you into the promised land. There are certain things when you read the Old Testament in the book of Judges where they served God, and then God rose up a prophet or a judge to say, you need to come back to God. Where they served God for a little bit, God blessed them, then they got away from God, and then God rose up a judge and said, you know what, you guys need to repent and turn around and come back to God. You need to put your idols down, you need to put down those things that separate you from me, and you need to come back to God. So it was more of a turnaround in the Old Testament when it came to the children of Israel. So God called them up out of Egypt and into the promised land. God is always bringing Christians into something better. He called them from up out of bondage to become free in Christ Jesus. He called you and I from the world and brought us into the church. He called us from being under the power and under the bondage of Satan to being identified with Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and to teach us. He is always bringing us out of something to bring us into something better. Even as you read the Old Testament, he took us from the Old Testament scriptures. He took us from the law into something that is better. The New Testament promises a covenant that was established upon the blood of Jesus and upon God's written word. So the New Testament emphasizes the inward nature of true repentance. The Old Testament emphasizes the outward expression in action of an inner change. When you put the two together, repentance is an inner change of mind resulting in an outward turning back or turning around to face and to move in a completely different uh, direction. And I believe that's why our church is a little bit different than other churches. Now, we are not a perfect church. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am not perfect. We are not flawless by no stretch of the means, but we have grasped this understanding of true repentance. Therefore, we are confident in Christ. We are secure in Christ. We know we were, where we are going when we die. We know we are going to heaven. We know no one can budge us away from God because we truly repented and identified with him. When I decided to repent, there was a change that took place in my life over 24 years ago. It was a decision that I make on, made on the inside. I was going in one direction, and then I repented. I did not even shed tears at that time. There was no emotion at that time. I just knew that I was on my way to heaven. I knew that Jesus saved me. I knew that, you know, I was no longer going to hell, so there was really no crying at the altar for me. There was no emotions. I was just like, you know, thank you, Lord, for saving me. And, and then uh, a couple Wednesdays after that, you know, Brother Johnny and a few other brothers prayed with me right here up front so I could get filled with the Holy Ghost. That is the power of God. Two different experiences. One, you become born again. Two, you get filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Two separate experiences. But when I gave my life to Jesus, 
I started moving in a different direction. I started going to church. I started reading the Bible. I started telling people about Jesus. I started, you know, reading my word. I started giving to the church. I started helping others. I, start, I stopped cussing. My wife said I used to cuss a lot. I don't believe that. Come on now. She said many things that I used to do, and I was like, no, no, you telling a tale. You know what that makes you? But no, I am so serious. There was an inward change of my mind and an outward turning around that is true scriptural repentance. And this is why I believe so many Christians live unstable lives. I'm not talking about people who are in here tonight or those of you who are viewing, man, you guys get the best teaching and you apply to teaching and God is blessing and helping you in your life and your walk with God. I'm going to prophesy things till they all come to pass. Amen. God is so good. But this is why there are some Christians who just feel that they are, are sorry for getting caught for the things that they do. They're sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got caught. And because I got caught, I, I tell the person I'm sorry. Now, prior to you getting caught, true repentance is saying, God, I'm so sorry for what I'm doing. Nobody knows about this right here but you. I'm going to repent right now, and I'm going to stop what I am doing. That's what true scriptural repentance is about. And when you look at Luke chapter um, um, 15, verse 11 through 32, the word of God talks about a young man who turned his back on his father, turned his back on his home, and went off into a distant land to waste all that he had. Most people focus on the deeds of the son, but they don't ever really look at the love of the father. They don't really look at the love of the father. They focus in on the deeds of the son. And there are sometimes even in Christianity where I see many Christians focus on the deeds of others. As opposed to understanding about the love of God, for it was by God's grace you have been saved through faith, not of works. At least any man shall boast. It's a gift from God. I had a phenomenal conversation with my son the other day, and um, we we're talking about 45 minutes about salvation and about being born again. And he said, Dad, you know, I know that you're saved, Dad, and you know that you are saved, Dad, but there are some times in my life when I just don't feel like I'm saved because I'm doing things that are wrong. And I said to him, prior to you giving your life to Christ, you, you, you are not saved. I said, you are born into a world of sin. I said, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. So you just naturally did things that were wrong. I said, but did you earn salvation? He said, no. Did your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds that gave you the ability to come to Christ? He said, no. He said, did you, I said to him, did you do a thousand, you know, Jesus, forgive me, Jesus, forgive me, Jesus, forgive me, Jesus, forgive me. He said, no. I said, what did you, what did you do? He said, dad, well, I just repeated after what you told me. I said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and life. I receive your word. I am born again. I said, all right. I said, the scriptures tell us through the obedience of one man, many are made righteous. So you did not have to do anything to become righteous before God, but repent, acknowledge you are a sinner and receive his word. So don't allow what you do. Come on now, church. Don't allow what you do to determine whether you are saved or not. That doesn't give anybody a license to sin or to continue to do wrong, just don't think that you saved yourself and that because of what you do, you get into heaven. It's by God's grace are we saved through faith, not of works, 
least any man shall boast. I receive his grace. I receive the gift of salvation. I am saved. I am born again. I am on my way to heaven because of Jesus. We are on our way to heaven because of Jesus. Don't ever forget about Jesus. You're going to heaven, Steve, because of Jesus. Pam, because of Jesus. Janet, because of Jesus. Betty, because of Jesus. Henry, because of Jesus. Not because your works of righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And everybody in here tonight, you're going to heaven because you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Now, when you look at this story, I said most people focus on the deeds of the son as opposed to the love of the father because there are many people who like to pick at other Christians for what they do or what they do not do. Let's just pray for them and believe God for, the, for them, that God will help them and God's grace will strengthen them, that when you see them, just say, hey, Praise God, you look good. I'm praying for you. And you know what? God has a plan for your life. And I think that will help us as individuals. And it will help the church. And it will help that person that you are speaking words of life into. So it says that this young man took and wasted all that he had. And eventually he came to himself. He was hungry. He was lonely. He was in rags. And he was sitting among the swine, longing for something to fill his stomach. And at this point in verse 18, it declares that I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. In our own state, when we're born into this world, this is a light right here. We are walking away from God every step until we become born again. We're entering into darkness and we're on our way to hell. And the only way we can come back is when we say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. We turn around, now we face into another direction, and we start walking into the light. God starts to reveal his word to us. He begins to speak to our spirit. We begin to do things differently. We're now on our way to heaven. We're now praying and we're now reading the Bible and we're now coming to church. And we're now doing what is right because we chose to repent. For every man who takes this course, there is one thing that they must do if they are not connected to Jesus is repent. Is repent. It's not in a, 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 a shedding of tears. Repentance sometimes do, is accompanied by tears because you realize how much you have been forgiven. We realize how much Jesus has done for us. But just to cry at the altar and leave and remain the same, that is not true repentance. That is, I'm sorry, I got caught. If I'm cheating on my wife and she catches me, that I'm going to die, number one, because of her. <laughs> so I'm going to meet my maker quick, right? But if, 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 if I don't... Before I get caught, say, Jesus, forgive me. I'm stopping this behavior right now. I'm stopping it right now. God, forgive me. I use my phone for pornography. You know, my wife come in the room. I flip my phone up real quick. Um, I'm lying. I'm stealing. I'm cheating. I'm doing all sorts of things that are not right. I'm not, let's talk about the inward nature. I'm, I'm being dishonest. I'm manipulating. I'm, uh, uh, um, you know, playing with people's emotions. I am being deceptive. Come on now. God is more concerned about the inward than he is the outward. But when you fix the inward, the outward will take care of itself. God begins to deal with our character, our morals, our values. I believe we're going to have a church where a church is not only excellent because of Christ, but because we understand about character and honor and respect and dignity and virtue and morals and all those things that, you know, make up a good Christian. When we come back to the values, sometimes we leave our values out. 
We take the word, we read the word, but we don't allow our values that God gives us on the inside to come forth or spring forth the fruits of the spirit, which is love, which is joy, which is peace, which is long suffering, which is gentleness, which is meekness, which is temperance, which is faith, the fruits of the spirit. God desires to develop those fruits in our life because when the root changes, the fruit changes. And every single person that is born again has a new root. Therefore, we should produce different fruit. We may be that only Bible that somebody who never reads the Bible can start reading. So repentance is different from remorse. Repentance is different than feeling sorry for yourself. Repentance is different than just crying. And in Matthew 27, verse 3 through 4, we're going to read about someone who felt remorseful, and his name was Judas Iscariot. Verse 3 reads, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful. And brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. And whatever, that's the wrong verse right there. It says that he was remorseful. And he brought it to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. That's what Judas said. But the word repented is not the same word that we talked about earlier. It's a different word. We're in a Bible study tonight. When you look at the original Greek word for some words, this is what that word means when Judas repented. The Greek word M-E-T-A-N-O-E-I-N means to change one's mind. That's the first one. Now, the one which M-E-T-A-M-E-L-I-N, that's a Greek word, which means he felt remorseful or anguish. So there are some people who have believed that Judas repented. Judas felt remorseful for what he did. They said, well, he gave back the 30, uh, 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 the 30 pieces of silver. That didn't mean anything. He felt remorseful. He felt sorry for, he felt sorry for what he did. Because the Bible tells us in the next verse that, Jesus, that Judas then went and hung himself. So if you truly repent, you stop doing what you're doing and you're turning to God and you're facing Jesus and you start to do what's right. If I am remorseful, that's an earthly sorrow. I'm going to continue to do those things that I've been doing prior to me getting caught. Example, if, I are, if, if there are certain things that my wife does not like, and I say I'm sorry, but I keep doing them, that's I feel remorse. I'm sorry that we're having this conversation. I'm going to tell you I'm sorry because I don't want to argue. I'm telling you I'm, I'm sorry because, you know, but I continue to do the same habits. That's I'm just remorseful. But now if she tells me to stop doing something, I'm saying, you know what? I apologize. I am so sorry. I'm going to do everything in my power to no longer do it again. That's true repentance. And the same is true when it comes to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We cannot use being remorseful or being sorryful or our shedding of tears every single night or every single day. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. God desires a change within. And that's why the Bible says if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Esau was somebody else who felt remorseful for the things that he did. The Bible says he sold his birthright to Jacob in exchange for a bowl of soup. It says that Esau despised his birthright. 
And we must remember that in despising his birthright, he despised all the blessings and the promises of God that were associated with his birthright. Later, Esau re, uh, regretted what he did and sought to regain that blessing. Why? Because he found no place of repentance. He no longer liked the blessing that he had being the first son. I'm going to tie this into our lives. He no longer liked what God had did for him. He took, he, he took what God did for him for granted. Oh, my goodness. How many times as Christian believers do we sometimes, not all the time, take his grace and his mercy for granted? How many times as Christian believers, not all the times, but sometimes we take advantage of church when the church doors open? Oh, I'm going to be able to come back to church when I want to come back to church. I'm going to be able to come back to church when I, you know, um, um, God is speaking to me about coming to church. I'm going to be able to pray, you know, in corporate prayer when God wants me there, you know, he'll, 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 he'll get me there. Does God speak to you when you need to pay your mortgage? Does he speak to you when you need to pay your car note? So why are you, you worried about him speaking to you about coming to church or, or, or coming into prayer or giving to the church? When God speaks to me, then I'll give to the church. Does he speak to you when you have to pay your cell phone bill? You do it automatically, don't you? Let's shame the devil and say, devil, you are a liar. Let God be true and let the devil be a liar. Amen. So let's not pretend that God is going to speak to us about coming back to church. God has already told you you should come back to church. One of the greatest things that Satan has did for a long time is try to divide the church, try to divide people, try to get us from fellowshipping, try to get us from praying for one another. You know what? That's a division. God is into unity. God established a church. I don't want to despise the church. I realize I need to be in church. How many of us believe that tonight? Hey, man, I, I realize that I need to believe I, I need to be here. Once a person has this understanding and truly realizes the difference between remorse and repentance, they start to enter into true faith. They no longer are unstable. They no longer are that they're, they're no longer a double minded individual. It's because they truly understand what God did for them and they are sorry. True repentance must always proceed true faith. John the Baptist, when he was in the wilderness, the Bible tells you and I, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's Mark 1, 3 through 4. It says, make his paths straight. He came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism for the remission of sins. Do we remember in that portion of scripture when there was many people who came to him and they weren't living right? And he said to them, bring forth the fruits, meet for repentance before I baptize you. When people get baptized in this church and we are going to have a baptism, they repented before God and they are now serving God. And so now they go down in water baptism, death to self and up into the new resurrected life. They are burying that old person in the grave. I believe the church sometimes needs to bury their old self. I need to bury my old self. My old self wants to, to, wants to you know, challenge the word of God. My old self wants to, you know, um, uh, try to debate what God's word. My old self sometimes will allow my feelings to get into the way of the spirit, where then I will start missing out on what God has for me. Do you believe that tonight? Our old lives, the Bible tells you and I, if any man is in Christ, let me go into Galatians. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. No longer I who live. No longer I who live. Those five words could radically change your Christianity if you understood what the Apostle Paul was saying in those verses. The Apostle Paul was a man who truly showed you and I what true repentance is. This man was killing Christians. This man was getting, to, this man was getting you know, laws passed to where he can go um, um, put them in jail and kill them until he had a true encounter with God. 
How many of us remember in the scriptures when there was one of the brothers who said, you know what, is that the same Paul who was killing Christians? No, nah, I don't want to be. Imagine, you know, this brother just got through finish killing mag, a lot of Christians and he's coming in the church. And I'm like, guys, we need to welcome him. Imagine how you would feel. I say, hey, Pastor DeMont, you know, keep an eye on him. He's going to sit next to you today. <laughs> Coming to church on Sunday. Pastor DeMont, keep an eye on him. He's sitting next to you today. Following week. Matter of fact, just take care of him for the month, Pastor DeMont. <laughs> then I want, you know, Brother Sam, Brother Henry, Brother Johnny. I want all y'all sitting around this, brother. Just pay attention to him. But he was somebody who continued to transform his life and wrote majority of the New Testament scriptures for you and I. This one who killed and persecuted Christians. Now, so let's not, you know, think that we can't do anything for God. We may have assassinated people with our thoughts or with our hearts or with our, you know, uh, our, our mouths or with our deception. But when we repent, we too can move forward with God. God is always looking for people to move forward. Turn to the na your neighbor and ask them, will you move forward in God? Now turn back to them and say, yes, I will. Matter of fact, tell them, I am moving forward with God. And now tell them, you better ask somebody. One of the first things that Jesus said was to repent, then believe. He said to repent, then believe. He said to repent, then believe. He did not say just believe. We must repent first. There are some gospels out there today that says only believe. Only believe and you will be saved. Dedicate your child to the Lord and your child will be saved. Go through water baptism and you will be saved. In order to be saved, a man, a woman of God, a man or a woman who does not know Jesus needs to repent and turn away from their wickedness and turn to Jesus Christ. True repentance, if I'm, I'm childish in my marriage, like I said earlier, is going to cause me to become mature in my marriage. True repentance, if I'm childish at work, I'm into gossip at work, is going to cause me to become more mature in my place of employment. True repentance causes me no longer to make excuses for why I don't do what I know I should be doing. Man, I know I should be reading the Bible, but I, I just didn't make the time to read it today. Man, I know I should be praying, but, you know, I have to do all these other things. Man, I know I should be uh, uh, telling people about Jesus, but I, I just don't have the time to do those things. We can make the time for God. We can make the time for the Holy Spirit to work and move in our lives. We can make the time to be able to hear his voice speak to our spirit. On Sunday, I'm going to remind the church that God doesn't speak to your mind. He speaks to your spirit. And that's one, of the, that's one reason why so many Christians are not spiritual. They are spooky. It's October. Nope, tomorrow is October. A lot of spooky Christians in Christianity, amen? Not here in our church. We are rising, raising up warriors for Jesus Christ. We are raising up men and women of faith who's going to take their world for Jesus. We have viewers that support us. They're going to take their world for Jesus. I prophesy that over you right now. You will take your world when you submit to the Holy Spirit for Jesus Christ. You got to be able to receive the word in order for that word to be manifested in your heart. And you got to change some things. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need to make an adjustment. You might want to write down in your journal. This is what Johnny and I were talking about the other day. Having a journal. I write down in my journal every single day. Matter of fact, I shared it with Steve as well. This helps me improve my self-awareness. This helps me right here improve, you know, I write my thoughts down when I'm angry, when I'm mad, when I'm upset, when I'm joyful. I write, you know, what God is doing in my life every single day in this journal. I become more self-aware because how many of us know that our flesh has a voice? Our spirit has a voice. 
And your mind has a voice of intellect, but our flesh speaks very loud. And if we don't crucify the flesh, when we don't allow that flesh to submit to the cross and receive the exchange from God, what is the exchange? God, I give you my shame and I thank you, God, for your righteousness. I give you my guilt and I thank you, God, for Lord Almighty God, your peace. I give you my chaos, I receive your peace. I give you my pain, I receive your joy. I give you my, my unrighteousness and I receive your righteousness. I give you my sin and I receive everything. It's the exchange at the cross. So I have a journal, I write down everything every day. Now this isn't a substitute this is not a substitute for my daily reading. It's not a substitute. This is something I've added that when I need to be reminded of what God did in the past, I open it up. That when I'm angry with my wife, I write down all the curse words in this journal about her. <laughs> I don't do that, but I put every thought down in this and whatever God speaks to my spirit, I place in this as well. And I say, Jesus, I want to thank you right now for bringing it to pass in my life. Even Rhea, she's Pastor Rhea, she put together a journal downstairs that was phenomenal. And I already started practicing that. That is added to our readings as believers. It's when you are able to get a scripture concerning what you're going through. If I'm going through a lot of uh, worry, I'll find that scripture that says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen. And then I would take that scripture for breakfast and I would meditate upon that scripture. I eat my meal, then I meditate upon let not my heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And then in that journal that she put together, that, is not, that, is, a, that is, is not a replacement for the Bible. It's something you add to it, right? It's you're adding to your spiritual walk. I write down, what does that mean to me? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What does that mean? God, is there something I need to repent because I've allowed my heart to become troubled? God, what do I need to do right now with this verse of Scripture? And I meditate on it every single day. We must renew our minds, and this enables you to renew your mind. If you're going through sickness, if you're going through a financial problem, if you're going through a marital problem, you go and you find a scripture and you write it down and you meditate on that scripture three times a day, four times a day, seven days a week, and it will bless your life. It's been blessing my life. It's been blessing those who have been doing it. Because I personally believe that there are sometimes we, we, we forget that God is for us and nobody can be against us. We forget that he gave us his word so that we can meditate upon it day and night and do accordingly to all that is written therein. And then my ways will become prosperous and then I shall have great success. When we meditate upon that word, we are muttering that word. We are saying, God, I will not allow my heart to be troubled. I will begin to trouble my trouble. When trouble comes, I'm going to begin to praise God. When trouble comes, I'm going to begin to worship God. When trouble comes, I'm going to bring that trouble to the feet of Jesus. When trouble comes, when worry comes, I'm going to say, you know what, trouble? I'm giving you to Jesus, and I'm receiving his peace. Because it says in Isaiah 26, 3, when my heart and my mind is stayed on him, he's going to give me perfect peace. So if I don't have peace, I'm going to meditate on peace. I'm going to allow that peace to go from here to in here. And so that's where many Christians are, you know, not in our ministry, ministry and not viewing. I'm trying to help us to no longer be unstable. So we have Christianity here and it needs to come here. Christianity for some is an intellect and it's not something where you where it's a spiritual connection. It's here and not here. Turn to your neighbor and say it's here and not here. See I need to get it from here to here and then it'll become alive. It'll become real. We come to church every week looking like me smiling and showing all my 80 teeth in my mouth. Amen. 
We come to church despite what we're going through, we're still going to trust Jesus and his word. Despite what we're going through, we're still going to trust his promises and hold on to his promises. Didn't Jesus says, let's continue to look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith? He's the author. He's the beginning and ending of our faith. And everything in between is you and I trust in the process and growing. Trust in the process and growing. Sometimes it's difficult for you and I to trust the process. Sometimes it's difficult for us to trust what we sow good into the kingdom of God. We must trust the process instead of pulling up what we have just sown. We pull it up by saying it's not going to happen. That's how we begin to uproot it. We pull up things in our lives by saying, I prayed for my marriage. And now I know it's not going to work. We pull things up by declaring healing over our bodies that are not well. And then we allow the voice of the flesh to speak to us and tell us we're still sick. Come on now. And then we say, you know what? You're right. So what we must begin to do that will be helpful is declare by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. The voice of the flesh is going to say, no, you're not. You still have a headache. You're going to say, by his stripes, I am healed. The voice of the flesh is going to say, nah, you still, you still feel the pain. You're going to say, no, by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. I receive it. I believe it. And I'm going to thank God until it manifests itself in this body. It goes from here to here. And then you declare what God says, his word, his word, instead of pulling it up. You're pulling up things outside today, right? You had to pull them up for something else to get planted. We have to pull up our past for good things to get planted. We have to pull up our old way of thinking for good things to get planted. We have to pull up our old behaviors for new thoughts to come on in the inside. As a man or as a woman thinks, that's how they are in life. So if I think I'm a particular way, that's how I'm going to feel, that's how I'm going to make decisions. You know what, I'm no longer making decisions based on my values in Christ, I'm making them based on the voice of the flesh. Tell your flesh to shut up right now in Jesus' name. <laughs> Say it loud. <laughs> Flesh? No, repeat after me. <laughs> Flesh? Flesh? Shut up in Jesus' name. In Jesus. Let's say it one more time like we mean it. Flesh? Flesh. Shut, up shut up in Jesus' name. It is no longer I that liveth. Oh, yes. Come on. Wow, man, this Come is on. some really good Bible truths. Yes, but the Christ that now lives in me. If Christ lives in you, it is no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. If you can become more aware and tell your flesh to shut up, it is Christ who now lives in me. Because the life I now live is by faith through the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Have that, it is no longer I that live. When you're in the car with your wife or your spouse, it is no longer I that live. When you're, you know, um, um, supporting the ministry, it is no longer I that live. When you are coming to church, it is no longer I that live. When you read your Bible, it is no longer I that live. When you pray, it is no longer I that live. When you give, it is no longer I that live. When you prophesy, it is no longer I that live. When you do good, it is no longer I that live. When you tell people about Jesus, it is no longer I that live. When you cast the devil down and you release the power of God, it is no longer I that live, but the Christ that lives in me. Yeah. 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 
When you go to work, it's no longer you that live. When you kiss your wife or your husband, it is no longer you that live. But Christ that lives in you. For the life we now live is by faith, man. Through the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When your body is not feeling well, it is no longer I that live. When you got a headache, it is no longer I that live. When you're upset, it is no longer I that live. When you are ticked off, it is no longer I that live. When things don't seem to be going right, it is no longer I that live. Hallelujah. When you want to cuss somebody out, it is no longer I that live. It's no longer you or I that live. Those of you who are viewing, we no longer living. It's the Christ who lives in us. The life we all live now is by faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, I live by faith. Tell him one more time, I live by faith. One more time, I live by faith. I live by faith. Declare it loud, I live by faith. I live by faith. I live by faith. I live by faith. I walk by faith, not by sight. Flesh, shut up. Don't tell your wife or husband to shut up. You might get knocked out. And so the way to true faith is understanding about true repentance. And so when we understand about true repentance, we're able to enter into, it's no longer I that live. It's, it's, we're able to enter into faith. We're able to understand it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Everything we do is because of the Christ that lives within us. The word says in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. All our interactions as sons and daughters of God is because the Christ who lives in us. It is he who began a good work in us who will fulfill that work in our lives. And so when we understand that we must repent first and then the times of refreshing will come, the times of healing will come, the times of peace will come, true repentance always precedes true faith. Without such repentance, faith alone is an empty profession. So without true repentance, meaning if I just say I'm sorry, I feel remorseful, and I don't change, it's an empty profession. And so that's why I say you have spooky Christians instead of spiritual Christians. Spiritual Christians are stable in Christ. If you're stable in Christ tonight, say amen. Amen. uh, Christians who are stable, they're not double-minded. Christians who are stable, they have repented, they have changed their minds, they have changed directions, and they are walking towards God's light. Christians who are, who are, who are uh, uh, stable and secure and mature are the ones who are disciples of Christ because they continue in God's word. Spooky Christians, on the other hand, they cuss people out and they love to say, you know what, God still loves me. I can act however I want to act. That's a spooky Christian. A spooky Christian plasters God on everything they have on Facebook and then you see them just running them up throughout society. Spooky Spooky Christians say, you know what? I love God. I don't have to go to church. Spooky Christians, they hit on men and they hit on women and they sleep with everybody. And in the name of Jesus, they have on their Facebook, I'm a Christian. Spooky Christians feel sorry if they get caught. They feel remorseful, but they really don't change. Spooky Christians justify their negative actions in the name of Jesus and they blame others and they point the fingers at others and they're quick to stay and they're quick to say, stop trying to judge me. A spooky Christian, please stay away from. Come on now. There are a lot of spooky Christians in society, but not here at Grace Fellowship. Not those of you who are viewing tonight. If you know a spooky Christian, let's all cast the demon out and let's just say, God, hallelujah, you will be true and every person a liar. 
And some of us know those spooky Christians on Facebook. We know them on social media. We need to continue to intercede for them. Because I must say this. There is a place where people can choose to walk away from God. And because of their stubborn refusal to obey God and obey his word, there's no other recourse for them. There is a heaven and there is a hell. There is a Jesus and there is a devil. There is a God, there is the Holy Spirit, there is Jesus Christ. There is the devil, there is his demons. As true, as true uh, born-again believers, we have to pick a side. We must pick a side. I'm going to stand on the side of righteousness. And I'm going to seek after righteousness along with you. And we're going to pray together that God will move upon our hearts and upon our lives. We're going to be there for one another. Faith, uh, those of you who are streaming tonight, we're going to be there for you, pray for you. We love you. And may God continue to bless your life, bless your family, bless your home. I want you to know, but we must decide to stand on the side of Jesus. We must decide to stand on his side. We cannot just believe and think that our charity and prayers and good deeds and religious rites and ordinances will get us into heaven. We must repent, we must turn to God, and we must follow after him. True repentance always precedes true faith. In order to remain or to become stable, we must truly repent before God. And it's not just saying, I'm sorry that I got caught. It's even before we get caught saying, God, please forgive me for what I have been doing. Without true repentance, there is no true stability. There is no true healing of marriages, of homes, of families, of societies. Society must repent and return back to Jesus. There are people out there who are full of themselves. And if you're full of yourself, you're not full of God. But when you empty yourself, you can become full of God's love, full of God's grace, and full of God's mercy. Ordinances and good deeds won't get us into heaven. Us truly repenting before Jesus Christ will. And when you truly repent before God, now you step into a, an arena of true faith. And when you step into that arena, you can now declare, as we declared earlier, it's no longer I that live, but the Christ who lives in me. Let's have everyone bow their heads tonight. Those of you who are viewing, I'd like for you to bow your heads if you're, um, as you have tuned in. If you have never truly repented before God, I would like to give you that opportunity right now. True repentance is you making a firm, inward decision, a change of mind that you're going to Leave darkness and follow after true light which comes from Jesus Christ. If I'm not a born again believer, it's saying I recognize I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. That's true repentance. And then there's a change of mind, of heart of direction in life. That's what true repentance is. If this is you today, and you never truly repented before God, you may have felt sorry, you may have cried that you got caught. There's many people sitting in jail today, they're sorry that they got caught. Not at the fact that they are truly repentant. If this is you today, you want to make a fresh commitment to Jesus Christ, lift your hand up and put it right back down in the sight of God. If this is you watching, you want to make a fresh commitment to Jesus, 
put your hand up and put it right back down. I see that hand. I see that hand in this congregation. Anybody else want to make a fresh commitment to Jesus? You want to truly repent. You want to say, God, I'm making this decision. I'm going to serve you, God, and I'm going to go all the way. If this is you, just lift your hand up and put it right back down. Hallelujah. Repeat after me, those of you who are at home and those of you in this congregation. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I truly repent before you today. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I'm making a firm inward decision. And I'm going to receive your word into my heart right now in Jesus' name. I will follow after Jesus. I will start to do what is right. I will come to church. I will help others. I will become more intimate with Jesus. I will recognize that it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Hallelujah. Just say thank you, Jesus. Just say thank you, Jesus. And if you ask Jesus today to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart and life, or if you made a fresh commitment to Jesus, those of you who are viewing, I'm going to ask you to follow up your decision by messaging us or visiting us on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. or 10 a.m. Allow God to bless your life. Those of you who are viewing, I'd like to say good night. I want to thank you for your support in everything that you have been doing for this ministry. Thank you for continuing to pray for us, our friends in the Philippines, our pastors. I want to thank you for continuing to just be a tremendous support. We love you and we thank you and good night. Hallelujah. As a church, we really like to thank you for tuning into today's truth. If you made Jesus Christ Lord of your life today, we would like for you to follow through with the commitment that you just made. You can message us or you can come and visit our church personally so that you can find out more about the decision that you just made. There are thousands of Christians that give their life to the Lord every day, but not many of them follow through. We would like for you to be able to follow through on your decision, know Jesus Christ personally. We don't want you just to go to heaven, but we would like for you to have heaven on earth. Come and visit us. We look forward to seeing you.